Hi, I'm Birdman Mel, and I want to thank each and every one of you for joining this old man on our new time at 8 o'clock now on Thursday nights. I hope you all had a great summer that were with me back when we did this thing up until about mid-June. Uh, but it's been, an, you know, kind of a different kind of year. But one thing that's been constant is God's nature. Things like this guy right here. This is my favorite month of the year for hummingbirds. So I can't help but talk one last time just a little bit about that. And I do that because this is the time of year that you can dramatically change the amount of hummingbirds in your yard. You want to do that? Well, listen on because I'm going to give you some tips. Some of them you heard a couple times before if you, if you listen. But there are some new things that I've observed and learned since we were together. And we're going to have fun doing that. Okay? We're also going to, later on this uh, little session, talk about how to do a few things right now to make sure your yard gets full of birds this fall and most of all this winter so you can enjoy them all through the cold season when it gets a little dreary and sometimes songbirds are about the only thing that keeps my old, you know, the old bird man spirits up. So stay tuned and I want to thank everybody that sent the cards and the encouragement and particularly the children. Some of you have sent in artwork and we've posted that and I want to encourage you all to keep doing that and we're going to talk about a new program that I, I'm talking about young champions of nature and you'll meet a young lady next week that I'll introduce later on. So uh, gonna be a fun time tonight and like always we're gonna give away some prizes. Not quite as many as we were doing there before but it's still gonna be worth your while to participate. Trust me. Okay and don't forget to ask questions and don't forget to tag your friends if you think there's somebody that uh, might like this session because that'll help you increase your chances to win. Now, as you know, I, I, I'm always not too bashful, so I want to make sure you knew my goals. You know, why do we do these things? Well, number one is to help you enjoy nature. Number two is to help the local merchants around you. All this stuff you see on the table, it can be bought from a local, you know, a wild bird store, a local hardware store that's serious about birding, or a nursery, because I'm going to talk plants some too tonight and support those local guys, because those are the ones that particularly in these tough times really need it. You know what? They're the guys that do some things like we do over at our store. And hello to everybody in mid-Missouri that comes to Songbird Station. God bless you. Our family business appreciates it, as will family businesses across America that are tuning in. And speaking of across America, tell me where you're from. Kip, hop on that old thing and say, hey, this is a, you know, Birdman Mel from New Jersey or Maine or wherever you're from. Let me know where you're from. That's another entry for you and helps you win. But, you know, all these local guys, many, many of them will load things in your car at curbside. So you don't even have to go in the store. That's the way it is at Songbird. Or you can go in and you can get advice and counsel that you won't get in any of those big old big box stores. And you know the other thing you get? You're going to get unique products like some of the things I'll show you tonight that big box, got, big box guys, they don't have it. And, uh, you know, and the, the other thing about these products is it's priced right. The things that I show, you're going to be able to buy at your Wild Bird store as inexpensively as anywhere, and that includes on the internet. So let's have some fun and talk about, you know, some fun things going on. There is a big change in the format. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm trying not to talk 120 miles an hour. A couple of you said, I love what you're doing, but slow that train down just a touch. So we're going to do that. But the other thing we're going to do is we're going to try to be more interactive. Send those questions. Tell me about a problem you're having. i got a couple people here. My dear wife, Bev, is here helping me and a couple other members, Ben, and uh, some other folks helping me. You know, you send the questions in. I'm going to try to bring them up as I go, okay? So send those things in, and that will also help you win prizes and that sort of thing. I'm going to need that cup of water there, young lady. <coughs> there are a couple more ways to win. As I said, hey, notice, red glass. When in doubt on hummingbirds, you want to use red, okay? Mm -mm. You know, speaking of that, hummingbirds need water too. Uh, we showed this thing on a hose before. I wish I'd have done it, but, you know, right now, this time of year, they're putting their beak in a lot of flyers, so if you got any way to put a mist out there for them, they are going to come and, you know, clean off their beak, clean off their wings, and you're going to find that that mist helps you a whole lot. So keep in mind water for the hummingbirds, too, in the form of a mist, okay? Now we'll start the questions. How much weight, what percentage of the weight does a hummingbird have to increase before he heads south? And do you realize those, you know, east of the Rockies, this is the question, which hummingbird is the one that it's the only one that most of us east of the Rockies gets. Send us in the name of that rascal, okay? 
And how much does he have to increase his weight? 25%, 30%, 50%? How much you think he has to increase his weight before he leaves your backyard and, and, and heads south, okay? And I want to talk about when are they going to leave, okay? Here in mid-Missouri, they're going to leave, you know, three, four weeks from now, they're out of here. Some of you, they may be, there's just a few stragglers left. Wherever you're at, let us know when you think they'll be leaving in your part of the world. I will tell you that you will not affect when they leave by leaving out a hummingbird feeder. You will not at all. The thing you'll do is help them increase that body weight. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer for that question now, so I hope you got your answer in quick. They have to double their body weight before they can leave, okay? And what affects when they leave? Well, a couple things happen, and I think some of my buddies left. You know, we just had a front come through mid-Missouri, and whew, a lot of wind out of the northwest with the first northwest wind. If I was a big old boy, and I had a couple of them out there, a couple more mature hummingbirds, they'd ate quite a bit out of my favorite hummingbird feeder here, and we'll talk about it. I would have caught that wind south, and a lot of them do. Hey, Miss Bev, thanks for the question. And she just asked a question that I'm going to cut in just a minute. And the question is, how do you keep hummingbird feeders safe from raccoons? Well, that's a tough one. There's mainly just two ways. We have some poles at our store and a lot of different, uh, the wild bird stores and suppliers have it. you got to put it on a pole with a raccoon baffle. And that's a big old baffle. I didn't bring one in here. I should have. But it's one a raccoon can't get by. And then when the hummingbirds are gone, it's a great thing to put your bird feeder on because they, they and squirrels can't get up it either. you got to do that. Or you got to bring them inside. And, uh, you know, uh, I frankly quit feeding birds on my uh, deck just a few weeks ago because when they were coming up to get the bird seed that I was putting out on the deck, they were knocking the hummingbird feeders down and stuff. And I got tired of it. So I just quit up on the deck a while. So the other thing you could do is quit feeding any sort of bird feed close to your hummingbird feeders. That might help you out. If not, you're going to have to have that squirrel and raccoon proof baffle. Good question, whoever asked that. But I want to go on and tell you, you know, what's, what makes a hummingbird migrate? And this old boy, you know, he's got to go all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of them do. Well, it's weather fronts, it's food sources. What if his food suddenly disappears? And we're going to talk about, got all different plants to talk about here in a little bit. But what if you forget the feeding? That's going to drive him away, okay? So one of your keys is keep that feeder full. And then the other thing is body weight changes. If he suddenly got enough body weight to head south, Hey, he just may go ahead and do that, and that's fine. But the, and then the other thing is length of day and temperature. And I got me another question coming in here. It says, you saw the video, what kind of feeders? I, we posted a video with all those birds in my yard. What kind of feeders do you use to get all these hummingbirds? And Paul Siegfried, thank you for asking that. Well, I'm going to tell you as we go along here, Paul, so just keep listening. So I'm going to give you that one in just a minute. But now is the time to get more hummingbirds in the yard. And how do you do it? Paul, the number one thing I do is I put out more feeders, okay? And I also use plants, and we'll talk about plants later on. But I'm not talking about, you know, you don't have to, this is my favorite feeder, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. There's a guy, Dr. Jay Whalen, invented this and licensed it to us. And I love this feeder for many reasons, and we'll talk about it. But what I would tell Paul or other people is get a little feeder like this one. This is what we call our big red. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek. But what is it? I've told you all many times, over and over and over. And this one actually comes loaded with nectar. Got a big mouth. It's easy to clean. These guys here, and it's inexpensive. So this, this, I, I recommend these big, big reds to all my friends. And right now, you know what I did is back four, six weeks ago, I had six, eight of these spread all around the backyard. Hummingbirds find them. Well, I've got any now because I got so darn many hummingbirds. I've got to have these guys out. And really, the other secret is don't run out. My feeders that start out like this, they, effective tomorrow, all of them will be switching up to a 32 ounce, and a couple of them will go to the big jug we finally got back in. COVID caused a lot of crazy stuff, including you couldn't get plastic to make these things. So you guys out in Arizona, California, Texas, I'm sorry it took us so long to get these, but they had better uses for that plastic. But Paul, the secret is have feeders out, but folks have lots of them out. And then... Uh, you know, you can do some other things, but that's my number one thing. If you haven't got them now, some tips I taught folks before is put out the big old Christmas bow. You know, tie the big red bow out there because there's still hummingbirds coming over mid-Missouri, lots of points, and you'll get them down and then have a good, clean hummingbird feeder for them. That's the secret. Don't let those feeders get dirty. I've been going on vacation, and young lady did a great job keeping all my feeders full and cleaning a lot of them. 
But I gave them what I call a deep clean. And I, I tell you what, every time I fill my feeders, we have a brush kit. It's called the 607, the world's best brush kit. It gets every part of every feeder. And I use this thing here, and it's long. It's with arthritic hands. I like it. I clean them ports in here, and I do like that. I pop this thing apart and make sure that I clean all of it. The whole thing will go in the dishwasher, so it, it does that every once in a while. You'll say, what in the world is all that stuff? Well, I love this feeder because those baffles in there keeps the nectar away from the ports, and when it sloshes, it doesn't leak, okay? That dude that invented this was one smart guy. He, he used even, I think, some kind of heart x-ray machine to do all the stuff on this. But it is, you know, it was called... But God bless him, Bob Sargent, he, who has passed away, but he was at a humming study group. He called it the world's best hummingbird feeder ever, and that, that's why we took it on, and I really like it. But, uh, you know, keep it clean. Every time I fill the feeders, I use this brush, and I use this other one here, just to get any little specks of that moldy mildew, because that's nasty stuff. It can hurt the hummingbirds, so keep your feeders clean. Now, you know, you, you leave, you forget to clean, you don't have somebody watch them. One big trick is if they're dirty, clean them really good, but then move them, okay? Don't leave them in the exact same spot because when you do that, they uh, they say, whoo, I eat there before, and that is a really nasty spot to eat, and I don't want to do that thing, okay, because I didn't feel good there. So that's an important thing is, is to move it when once you do that. They say, why does a feeder get mold? It's because moisture and sugar in a hot temperature, it's going to get moldy, so you just got to clean it. Now, there is, I don't use it because I tend to fill my feeder so fast, but there is a, a little thing that, that if you don't have many hummingbirds from Sapphire Labs, uh, there's a nectar protector little thing that you can put into every batch of nectar, and it'll help you keep that safe, okay? How do you stop the bees? I mean to tell you, you guys, did somebody give out my program ahead of time? Because that's some of the stuff we're going to call. So let me talk about bees now. Now remember that Dr. JB's? Gotta get this thing back up here. When a hummingbird comes here to get his nectar, same way here, he's gotta go down to get it. A bee stinger is not near as long. A hummingbird's tongue, I mean, it's long. It's like this long here. And it'll go in there to get that nectar. But a bee stinger can't get in there. So one of the things you wanna do is don't, you know, these feeders are designed, you can fill them up and the bee still can't reach them, okay? But many feeders, particularly the ones, forgive me, you find in box stores, the nectar comes down to a port and it's down there at the bottom. And anything that's got any little stinger at all can go in and get it, a bee or a wasp. So it's a lot on working with the store that knows the kind of bee feeders and stuff that are, are bee resistant. So doing that, now I've noticed a couple of things myself. Well, what are them bees doing on Birdman Mel's feeders? Well, guess what I've done? I've gotten sloppy fill on it. Or I've taken this feeder here, I filled it, and I said, oh, I hope I got that filled. And I go burp, 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 burp to make sure the nectar runs out of that. Stupid, stupid, stupid. What did I do? I just splashed honey for the bees around. I splashed the sugar water. So I've learned to do a couple things. One, I've learned not to burp it, but if I forget, every time I fill this hummingbird feeder, I take a big old cup of water like this, and then I pour it over the top of it just in case I splash some sugar water out or something. Now, that won't hurt. help one of those, you know, them cheap feeders that you might get at Wally World or whatever where that nectar is right down at the port because not a lot you can do. The bee can just stick his little stinger in there and he can get it. But all the good ones we sell at Songbird Station and your local suppliers that sell that good Songbird Essentials and Aspects, Dro Yankee, those kind of brands, they keep the nectar away. So uh, that's how you keep the bees away. So great question. Same deal on Yellow Jackets, Wasp. It's all about don't have that sugar water where they can get to it, okay? And make sure, you know, I think giving them bass is something I never told you about. One thing I wanted to show you guys, because a lot of you got these JB feeders, particularly in mid-Missouri, and we appreciate that. One little trick I learned is take a spoon here. We got them flyers on here, and you just press down, pop, pop, pop. And I can pop them blooms right off of there. It makes it real easy. It makes it hard, a lot easier than old old hands trying to do that. So remember to use a spoon if you got when you buy your Dr. JB's. It makes popping them things out easy. Jay Whalen taught me that. Thank you, Jay, for doing that. They say, do we clean with bleach or soap? Nope. Hummingbird feeders, I clean with just water and I clean them really good. You know, at the end of the season, if you wanted to use soap or bleach, then rinse them really good and leave them. But I think that most folks would agree that by using bleach or soap, during the season, there's some things that, that will discourage the hummingbirds from coming. And 
uh, you know, one part sugar, four parts water works good for nectar. We got a really fine bar sugar, we call it. Uh, that's uh, It's all 100% uh, sugar cane sugar. That's very important. I, I, I do believe that's better than beet sugar. We don't use honey. We don't use anything else. And that's my favorite thing. And, uh, you know, it mixes up really quick. I don't have to boil it to get it in suspension. So uh, that's some of the tricks to bees and wasps, okay? Is just keep that nectar away and, and it'll work good. My gosh almighty, you guys. I already hit a bunch of what I wanted to talk about. Also want to talk about, don't forget, we showed you this guy thing earlier in the year. This is called a humbug. And a humbug is something you go in here and you just fill it full of banana pieces. What, what do you think? They're going to go and eat them bananas? Nope. They are going to eat the little bitty fruit flies that come because hummingbirds eat insects for their vitamins, their minerals, and their protein. So you can buy a humbug, and I have noticed, I forgot to put bananas in mine. My wife pointed that out to me. But guess what? It still acted like a really good magnet. Everything that comes to our yard says, hmm, that looks like a big red thing. What's going to eat there? And that reminds me, I have gotten more sold than ever. We make recycled plastic feeders here in Mexico, Missouri, out of red. And we make it out of green and blue, but I am sold on red. This happens to be a window suet. This is one all summer. This I enjoy just putting out a little bit every day. That's how I beat them raccoons in the summertime most of the time. If I didn't put out too much, it's just a few few things, maybe a few whole peanuts for the blue jays. They'd come grab one, go away. My wife and I like to enjoy a cup of coffee, looking at the hummingbirds and, and looking at this. And we maybe have had a beverage or two in the evening where we do the same thing. And uh, that is important as you get to know your hummingbirds and your birds. If you do that every evening, it'll be easier to use those rings that I was going to talk to you about in a little bit. Okay? But uh, don't forget that you can also put out that fruit in just a, a plate. I did find the hummingbirds coming up to the window. I got this little red recycled hummingbird uh, feeder here for the window. And, you know, they come and look for it. And then if you got your window feeder, and what some of my favorites are this guy here from... Uh, Aspects is an awful good feeder. It's, uh, they make great folks. Uh, those are great folks out in Connecticut. Make really good made in America feeders like all of ours are. And it's just a nice way to get them up close and personal. You want to get really up close and personal, we make these Holland Hill feeders here in Mexico, Missouri. It's a test tube. And you got a little thing here, a bead. And a hummingbird will come up in here. And you can see that hummingbird's tongue come all the way up in here. Really great thing to teach children about the anatomy of a hummingbird, okay? And these beads here are important because they see red and they come say, hey, what's that? Okay, so some fun stuff there. So lots going on there. I did want to talk to you about, okay, I said keep it clean, keep it full, and keep the ants out of it as well as the bees. These two guys here are really important. We call these rascals nectar protectors. And if any of you from the shelter workshop are listening, by gosh, you'll be glad when it's safe and you can go back to work helping us put these rascals together. We miss you this summer, guys. So stay safe, but when it's time, we need your help again. But you put these things above a feeder, and yeah, some feeders have them work built in. But I'll tell you something my wife and I have really noticed as we watch the birds more this year than usual. You fill these full of water and keep them clean, because they get kind of gross up there, you know, because the ants can't swim. They don't get across it, so bugs build up in them and stuff. You want to remember to clean them out because the tip mice, uh, the little... Uh, chickadee, the, the downy woodpeckers, they come and say, oh, Birdman Mel, thank you. This is my own personal little water. I don't have to line up with them big old cardinals and blue jays and stuff over at the bird bath or out where you got that water feature. So remember these things. I really believe them. I've gotten more so than ever, not just as a moat for, you know, the ants, but also as a little feeder. I'm thinking about leaving them up and putting water in them year round over my bird feeders, just so my little tip mice can continue to have their thing. So... Don't forget that, just a fun thing. I forgot to tell you on bees, Avon Skin So Soft has been proven to be a safe way, you know, to put a little something on some of them feeders that are hard to keep the bees out of. So keep that one in mind, okay? So what else was I gonna talk to you about tonight? Well, I wanna talk about some observations. I wanna make sure, you know, you, you learn about looking. One thing surprised me, Jay, I didn't ever know why you had this little rail around here, except I thought, oh, that's a neat thing for the hummingbird to, uh, to stand on. Well, what I noticed is one guy was here and they just scoot, 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 right over there. So it's fun. I didn't know that a hummingbird could do that little movement sideways. So just a fun thing to, to watch a, a, as you go along. Now, speaking of watching, I want to show the thing that we have a lot of fun with our grandkids on. And you notice I'm, this is a big old cake pan here. What it is, I'm showing you a way to keep the ants out of the hummingbird rings if you put them out. 
I rec these are hummingbird rings. You can put these on your fingers. The hummingbirds will come up and feed out of your hand. But you can't just go out the door and say, hey, hummingbirds, come here, come and eat. You got to go out and put them out at first, in my opinion. It's a lot easier to do this, have them out there for a morning or two, or evening or two, then stand by them, then put them on. One of the things I noticed is the blasted ants. We're getting into them. So got smart, put them in a cake pan, put water in the cake pan, ants can't get to it. Now, I could have put in here a, you know, a little a shot glass, a little bitty cup that held these, or I could have put in a thing full of sand in a pot. Those are some of the different ways I've done it. So if you've never did a, a hummingbird ring, you just put these things uh, on the finger here and you know you hold it out like that and they'll come right to you. Takes a little bit sometimes to get it done. I re some of the tips are put these out like I said here. If you can wear the same clothes all the time when you're sitting out there, they get used to you. If it's red, that's pretty cool. They'll come visit you. Then you wanna sit down you know, by them and, and hold still. Put sunglasses on, particularly the children because they will see your eyes move and then just be patient. The best time to do it, you'll find if you watch your hummingbird feeders, and you'll see we posted a glass of wine by a feeder on a table. You know, we can set at a table, have that hummingbird feeder sitting there, and they'll come in and feed while we enjoy a little beverage. So, uh, you know, you'll learn by watching that there's a little moment in the 10, 20 minutes before uh, sundown where they really feed, and that's the best time to do it with the kids, okay? The other time is early in the morning, but. Sometimes kids are wanting to watch cartoons or they're not over at grandpa's then. So, you know, remember that late evening thing, particularly the next three weeks. A great, great time to use the rings and enjoy nature. Okay? Some fun things there. Okie dokie. I did want to talk about plants before we run out of time here today. I believe in natives. And, whoops, got to be careful here. This has been traditionally one of my favorite plants. And why don't you put them plants up there for me? We're just going to go ahead and do it. That one there is a pinta. Pinta is a plant, and all of these have been bought over the years locally, giving gardens in Columbia, Strawberry Hills, Callaway Fields up here. I believe in doing business with all those guys. And pinta over the years has been one of my favorite plants for hummingbirds and butterflies. A little lower, and it, for me, doesn't start blooming until it gets hot. That's this guy right here. Okay, and you can see it on the screen. That guy right there is crazy. If somebody knows the real name of it, let me know. I bought it years ago. This is part of it. You can see it all down my fence. I caught, I was told it was Cardinal Climber. I'm a little nervous. It can really get crazy. It actually gets, you see how it gets on my fence. You know, I, I don't want to recommend an invasive plant. So I do tell you, make sure you, you know, you're going to have to stay after this thing. Cause I've, I planted this, oh gosh, four or five years ago. And now it's spread over the whole fence. I can pull it up. I can get rid of it easily. My hummingbirds love it, and it blooms this time of year. Now, it is a plant. If you'll notice, you know, it's not uh, wide open at night. It's one of those plants that just opens in the morning. So it's one of the things I see a gazillion hummingbirds all over it in the, humming, in, the, in the morning, okay? Now, that one there is just geraniums, and I use them that it helps to have a couple stop signs. Not a great hummingbird plant, but we, have, we always have two great big old pots of red geraniums at the, uh, out by the back stairs because that helps draw them in. Okay, next one. Now that's my favorite one. Um, these are uh, got this one this year from over at the nature, uh, the natural plant people over in Columbia. It's I call it drop more scarlet honeysuckle. A really really good plant. You see the big open throat there. Okay, next one. That's impatience again. Not my favorite. I don't think it's the hummingbird's favorite nectar plant. I don't see them working it as hard as the other things. But I tell you what, that's a big old stop sign to bring them down. You know to see your yard and and, and to eat them. Okay. And then Lantana, that's this little guy here. And it's got just a lot of little pad plants. And this is a gr all of these, many of them are great butterflies, but particularly this and the Pinta are also great butterfly plants. I love Lantana because it kicks in when it's warm. Let's have another one. That one there is just your typical, uh, I think it's Maud Villier or something like that. I don't use this a lot, but uh, I was given one when the plant nurseries were sharing uh, plants with me. It is a good one to draw them in. I haven't seen my hummingbirds working it too much, though, but I think in the south, uh, they must have some different varieties because it's a heck of a hummingbird plant. Next one. Okay, that one there, if somebody knows what it is, I planted it, got it over at Giving Gardens a couple years ago, and it was a salvia of some sort. And if anybody knows what this stuff is, tell me because it keeps coming back. I love it. Seems like maybe it doesn't have quite as much nectar as it used to, so I'm wanting to know what it is so I can get some more. So if anybody's got that figured out or that cardinal climber, you, you tell old Birdman Mel and I'll send you a free bird feeder, okay? Last but not least, two of my love, 
what you got left there. That's one of the favorites. I got to confess, this is the first year I've had success. I finally found a wet spot up in Mexico, Missouri, in my yard to grow this cardinal plant, which is a lobelia. And then the other one I got that was not in there, that happens to be red salvia. Uh, that is more of a, uh, it draws them in type thing. But cigar plant was one I forgot to take a picture of, and that's my other favorite. So that's the botany lesson for today. All good plants to, to bring them in. I forgot to mention, if you like decorative feeders, one thing we found is, is my son Grant came up with these balls, and I love these things because so many of the balls had the ne you know the nectar down here. They dripped and everything else. This one, they feed from the top. Bees and wasps aren't a problem. And guess what? They like setting on this little bitty bar right here. And speaking of that little bitty bar, if there's ever a time to have fun, put a hummingbird swing out right now. They will actually swing on these things, and it's just fun to watch, fun to photograph them. And you know, them hummingbirds get tired of fighting and they like to have a place to set. So just a fun thing to, to do as you go along, okay? Well, it's gonna talk about, you know, how you draw other birds in and what else we're gonna talk about next week. But there's one thing I wanna tell you right now is don't deadhead your plants. You know, I was taught, you know, yes, during the year, it's the thing to do, it gets you more blooms. But now that they're getting tired, let those cone flyers, let those marigolds, let those salvias in your yard because all winter long, you're going to see a bunch of birds we'll talk about in the future come to those. Okay, so don't do that. The other thing to do is do keep feeding some stuff, and we'll talk next week about what to feed, but keep putting out a little bit. They're not going to eat feeder fulls right now, so don't fill everything blown full, okay, because God's letting a lot of stuff come in on nature, so you want to, you know, you want to not overdo it, okay? Next week, besides talking about that, I'm going to introduce you to a young lady, Holly Wilcox. She is a Girl Scout that sent me some incredible big old signs that she put out as part of a Girl Scout project. And we're going to show those with you and talk about it. And we're going to learn together some things on Kiel Deer. And we got them here in Central Missouri. We're going to talk about Cardinals and we're going to talk about Bluebirds. So a bunch of fun things there. And uh, looking forward to having Holly come in through Zoom and she'll talk with us, okay? And do, you know, Nominate your children. If you got something they've been doing neat, a really neat project or whatever, let me know about it because I'd love to share, if not them on the air, some of their projects on the air and encourage them to tune in or if it's getting a little late with his 8 o'clock time, hey, these are all posted at birdmanmail.com. So maybe look at one or two, see, see if they like them or not. So that could be some fun, okay? Did want to warn you about upcoming programs. You're going to be excited because you won't just hear from me. You're going to have Jim and Julie Lundstedt. Some of you know them from Central Missouri. They're going to be, they were on before and everybody said, bring them guys back. Well, they're going to be talking about owls and winter bird feeding early, later on. And we're going to have back, hopefully, Stan Tequila, Stan for a show or two. We're going to have back that guy that did optics. Remember him that helped us with that beginning course? We're going to try to learn some more about using that. So all those things are coming up in the future, along with a bat expert and a butterfly expert. So lots and lots of fun things. So, uh, you know, keep those questions coming. We're going to keep answering them after the show. Please share photos and videos of hummingbirds and different birds, particular hummingbirds this month, because I'm going to give you a grand prize. We're going to give you your choice of either a stained glass. we got a big one or a little one here. This one's my favorite in the window, big old one for on the mantel. Or if you want a hanging glass bird bath. And all these are available at your local retailer. But the best video and the best photo we're going to pick this month for all month that come in on hummingbirds, you're going to have your choice to win one of these. So fun thing going on there. So keep that in mind and send those photo, photos, send those videos, and we'll have some fun. And I did want to thank all of my staff tonight, uh, Mr. Ben, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, uh, Annette, uh, Erica, my wife, Bev, everybody here that helped me do this because without them, we couldn't have done it. So last thing i got to say is thank you again for tuning in. I broke my promise. I talked off fast. I'll learn to have just a little bit less next week. But we'll have some fun stuff. I hope you learned something you like. And uh, stay tuned. Within 15, 20, 30 minutes, we'll announce all the prize winners from the night. Keep asking questions because the wheel keeps turning as you keep interacting. It helps us pick winners, okay? Uh, and uh, we just thank you very much. And, you know, as I said, through COVID, it was a tough time. But one, one phrase I repeat to myself like I tell many of you and as I close every session is, don't forget. Nature is a stress reliever from God. Take time today to listen to the birds sing. See you next week and keep them questions coming. Thanks.